Uh, we have a, a, an interesting uh, presentation today. Uh, one of the things that have happened to Latin American immigration, and first of all, Latin America, one of the particularities about Latin America in the history of migrations is that it was traditionally a receiving region, right? People will come to Latin America. After World War II, it has become a sending region. People leave for, for Latin America, leave Latin America for other places. But one of the things that has happened in the last four decades or so is the diversification of destinations. Originally, it was mostly the United States. that goes back to the Mexican war and the, uh, that part of, most of Mexico became part of the United States. Most, the earliest Mexicans in the United States were not here because they migrated, the border moved, the border migrated, right, to, to where it is today and, and they found themselves in a new country. Uh, but in, in, in the uh, last few decades, there has been a, an enormous diversification uh, of Latin American destinations of Latin Americans. Spain has become a major destination. There are more than two million uh, Latin Americans uh, in Spain, Italy, Germany, uh, Israel, uh, originally Jewish Latin Americans, but eventually non-Jewish Latin Americans too. And one of these, these new destinations is Canada. Uh, I remember that originally uh, 40 years ago, the only Latin Americans in Canada were mostly Chilean exiles, uh, and, and now, and a few Argentines ex exiles, but mostly Chileans, and now there is a diversity of groups, Mexicans, Salvadorians, and we had a, a, a person uh, that is perfectly situated to tell us about this phenomenon in Canada, because Victor Armory is a sociologist, is a professor at the Uni of Sociology at the University of Quebec at uh, Montreal, but he's originally from Argentina, and he has been working for a long time on these questions of identity, questions of uh, policy, questions of uh, political discourses vis-a-vis -vis immigration, and one of his last uh, works, well, not, the, one of the, not the last, but the penultimate, uh, book was uh, actually about uh, immigration in Montreal, in French, well, in, in Quebec, in uh, French Canada. So he has the capacity to, learn, to tell us a lot, a lot about the formation of Latino communities in Canada in general, but also of comparing how is it in Anglophone Canada, in Francophone Canada, which presumably has a Latin connection to Latin America, at least it's a Romance language, uh, so I'm very curious about what he has to tell us, and thanks a lot for coming, and we'll continue the conversation later. Thank you. Well, uh, hi. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Jose. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, here and uh, to have the occasion to uh, uh, present some of uh, the research I do on uh, migration in Canada, particularly in Quebec, and uh, focusing on Latin Americans, uh, as Jose mentioned. So, uh, yeah, I will be talking about uh, Canada, but I will introduce uh, from the very start a comparative uh, perspective, and uh, I would say uh, a dual uh, comparative perspective, because I will do s what we could call a uh, inter-country comparison. I, I will use the U.S., as a reference, uh, and I will explain why, uh, because it's not just comparing two, uh, two things, two realities, but it's mostly trying to decenter the analysis of Latino diaspora formation from the U.S. towards other destinations, as you were saying, and so I would like to put my, my analysis on a North American context. Of course, that includes Canada, and we will also see that we can address some uh, parallels and contrasts in a intra-country comparison. That is comparing, as you mentioned, uh, Quebec, French-speaking Quebec, and uh, the rest of the country, uh, which is uh, English-speaking. So that means, in a way, I'll, I'll talk about that, three societies, I mean, I'm simplifying, but in a way we can talk analytically of three host societies for immigrants in North America. 
the US, with all its diversity, of course, you know, I'm simplifying, but then, you know, again, analytically, two more, English Canada and Quebec, and we will be comparing the three of them, because that leads us to understand, for instance, what's the effect of the whole society, its institutions, its policies, its cultural framework regarding people coming from overall the same region, Latin America. So uh, uh, bringing with them maybe a common language, a common cultural heritage, even if we can also you know, question the very notion of a single uh, Latin American identity, of course. So, uh, uh, yeah, this is the one. Uh, this is the plan for this evening. Uh, I'm not making any promises about the fact that I will stick to the plan, but it's always nice to, to start with a plan, okay? So that's it, and I, I'll try not to spend more than five minutes on each of these uh, points. Actually, you know, uh, three points first, and then a second part uh, with uh, another three points. Uh, again, uh, the idea will be to uh, set first this North American context uh, for migration issues, then uh, we focus on the Canadian case with the, uh, this distinction of, of, of Quebec as a uh, quasi-country uh, in the context of North America, and I will tell you why I'm saying that uh, Quebec uh, can be seen in some regards as uh, comparable to a country within, uh, an independent country, even within a confederation. Something like, you know, for instance, one nation within the European Union. Uh, in terms of the, for instance, the, the ability that Quebec has in terms of selecting its own immigrants, which is uh, unique uh, in the Western world. Uh, and then, you know, the second part, I will uh, give you some data uh, that allows us to compare uh, uh, Latino, Latin American, Hispanic populations in these contexts. And uh, I, I'd like to uh, say a few words. I won't have much time to theorize, but at least, you know, to discuss uh, what we can call, you know, we, with authors that maybe you know, Rogers Brubaker or uh, Richard Alba, uh, ethnic boundary making. That is the ways in which the boundaries that define a minority uh, are uh, constructed in a given uh, society. And then I will end with, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, some ideas. There's no conclusions here, but, you know, uh, some issues that we might want to, uh, to uh, further explore, uh, particularly in terms of, uh, again, in a North American perspective, the fact that uh, we have very uh, highly different structural factors playing out in terms of uh, what the United States and Canada represent as host societies in, in the current uh, context, in the current world, uh, but also mutual influences. When I say mutual influences, it's mostly the U.S. influence in Canada. There's not much uh, influencing coming from Canada towards the U.S., but, but you might know that Canada is used sometimes as a model uh, for some uh, ideas about reforming uh, immigration policy in the U.S., like saying, look at Canada. They're doing fine. Let's try to uh, import their uh, ways of doing. And I, I would like to uh, also, you know, focus on some of those uh, uh, arguments, uh, even if quickly, so to, uh, in order to maybe, uh, you know, misspell some myths about, you know, the, the great Canadian approach to immigration. That is, it's a good one, but it's maybe also some uh, uh, where uh, certain flaws can be uh, identified. And while current trends maybe just talk about what's happening now, right now. So, uh, first, uh, let's start with the inter-country uh, comparison. So let's try to see a couple of things about you know, this idea that might be seen as foolish, uh, comparing the U.S. and Canada in terms of immigration, particularly in terms of a Latino, Hispanic, Latin American immigration. Of course, we're talking about, and again, I will give you some, 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 some information about that, hugely different history. You were mentioning that, but not only that, geography, of course, size, size, the, the size of the countries, but also the relative size of 
uh, the Latino, Hispanic, Latin American uh, diaspora within these two countries, but also the patterns of settlement, integration, the socioeconomic structure, their uh, distribution, spatial distribution in each of those countries. So uh, Blomrad, uh, a scholar that has uh, written a lot about uh, the Canadian approach to immigration, uh, asks regarding uh, this topic, are Canada and the US like apples and oranges, or are they like two peas in a pod? Well, of course, I mean, either or, or maybe there's something in between. Actually, I would say, I mean, if you ask me, I would say that it, in regard to, uh, to immigration, Canada and the US are really apples and oranges. So that means that they're very different, yeah. But on the other hand, uh, why not compare, try to compare apples and oranges? Because maybe, you know, we can learn Something about that, I, I know, I, I mean, they're both round, they, we, we could compare the, I don't know, the, the, the color or the, or the, the sugar uh, component or whatever you can find in, in, I don't know what you do when you analyze fruit. Anyway, but uh, uh, I think that we can learn, and definitely in, the, in Canada we can learn by comparing with the US, but I, I you know, humbly submit that maybe the US could also learn something when comparing with other countries, and which country would you compare to? Well, maybe let's start with uh, your northern uh, nice neighbor. Uh, actually, I need to ask the question, I raise the question, uh, is there even a meaningful, is there even a meaningful pan-ethnic uh, Latino, Hispanic, Latin American identity? Again, I mean, that's an open, question. Uh, we can have uh, different answers to that. Uh, do we have uh, shared attributes, you know, as Latin Americans? Uh, uh, are there ties, real ties, substantive sociological ties, economic ties, cultural ties? Uh, is there a feeling of belonging among Latin Americans even before they become immigrants? I mean, Chileans, Argentinians, Mexicans, Salvadorians, what do they have in common? But I'm interested in looking at that as a common origin that sometimes to a certain extent can become a mythic origin or, or a, an origin which becomes a reference after several generations of people settling in a host society. You can start now talking or thinking about uh, Latino, Hispanic, Latin American minorities, as you mentioned, Jose, not only in the US, but also in other countries, Spain, Australia, France, Italy, uh, and a last question that becomes more and more relevant is one about the construction of a transnational or global Latino diaspora. I mean, is there anything going on, and I will get to that at the end of my presentation, in terms of a connections between Latinos in Australia, Latinos in the UK, Latinos in Canada, Latinos in Spain. Is there anything, or w will we be talking at some point of this as a global phenomenon, uh, or we just have to assume that uh, starting with a very fragmented sense of uh, common identity, again, you know, Brazilians, Mexicans, Guatemalans, and then settling in Australia and in Italy, is there anything that uh, leads us to believe that we will be talking about a diaspora, something that they might have in uh, common? <coughs> so, just, you know, a methodological note. Uh, I'm very interested in what we call the divergent approach. I mean, you can study a minority uh, in a linear uh, way. That is, you follow, you know, uh, maybe uh, through generations how, for instance, uh, Puerto Ricans have settled in the city of New York. And you can, you know, look at it historically and the evolution and what's happening now, second, third generations, so on and so forth. That's, of course, one way of looking at it, which is extremely important. The second way is what uh, we might call the convergent comparison. That means that you compare two groups. So let's say, uh, Latin Americans or Latinos and uh, uh, people from Southeast Asia. And you take the same country or the same city or the same neighborhood or the same uh, sector 
of the economy, and you compare, and you say, okay, you know, and you can see, for instance, divergent um, uh, trajectories. Huh? Uh, you know the, the for instance, uh, Portes' uh, uh, theory of, uh, of uh, segmented assimilation, where, for instance, the, the paths of integration might differ from one group to the other. But there's a third way of comparing, which is, uh, you will see those quotes, uh, maybe the most interesting of them all, but on the other hand, very difficult to, uh, to, to develop, and sometimes because of it, at least in the, UN, in the US context, this strong pull towards keeping the research within the borders of the United States, of the American society, instead of looking abroad and maybe, again, uh, uh, comparing, comparing with other societies and saying, well, maybe what's going on here is comparable or not, and why, mostly why, are the institutions, the, the, the general framework, history, geography that makes uh, things uh, go differently. So the divergent approach is taking into account different host societies, which might tell us about why the same kind of immigrants settling in those different societies will go different ways or follow different paths. And that's, again, one of the things that I find very interesting in terms of, of, of using Canada as a reference. When you have a, a Colombian immigrant today settling in Toronto, Canada, English-speaking Toronto, Canada, another Colombian from, with the same background settling in French-speaking Montreal, and then you have a, a third Colombian, again from the same background, settling in New York City, and another one in, let's say, I don't know, Texas, they might start with a common sense of belonging to Colombia, maybe they will develop a sense of belonging to a Colombian diaspora, uh, but at some point they will defer, they will diverge in terms of how they feel uh, their own Latino-ness, if you will, uh, impacts or not, and to what extent, in their experience as an immigrant in a uh, host society. So, in a way, this is a very, you know, simple uh, graph, you know, just to, to, to raise the question about to what extent, to what point we need to follow the idea of something that would be shared uh, starting with a common origin, but then following a process of construction of diaspora formation, at one point we might wanna say the sense of Latino belonging identification is over, is uh, overtaken by different forms of identity. For instance, at one point you might feel more Canadian or Quebecois or American or New Yorker, depending on the level where you set your uh, identification as a person, as a group. And at some point you might also uh, embrace other ways of identifying yourself, maybe within a minority. Uh, you might be a black person from Brazil who will embrace a black identity in the US or Canada instead of uh, uh, staying uh, you know, connected to uh, the, the identity of as a Latino or a Hispanic person. Again, uh, what I'm seeing, you know, my research mostly deals with comparing uh, Quebec and the rest of Canada. And I see very interesting things going on because again, you might say, well, the US is very different, but this intra-country comparison lets me to believe, leads me to believe that again, you know, groups w which are very similar in terms of objective but also subjective definitions of their own sense of belonging as Latinos or as Colombians or Argentinians or whatever, and then settling, integrating into a different uh, country, into a different society, they will become something else. I've tracked their opinions, for instance. Uh, I've done uh, in the past some surveys, some survey uh, analysis, for instance, of uh, what you think about, I know, uh, I don't know, for instance, um, uh, should we have, sh is it better for a society to have a common single language? And unsurprisingly, the opinions of the same Latin American immigrants will differ, 
will differ whether they settle in, in, in French, Quebec, or in English Canada. Because the, 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 you become part of a society where some values and notions of the, usually those from the, uh, held by the majority, will become yours. So you become Americanized, that's no surprise. You will become Canadianized, English Canadianized, and you will become, uh, as, a, uh, as, as in my own case, in a way, become French Cubesicide. I don't know if that's uh, an appropriate or uh, understandable term. So let's uh, move to uh, this very, may, may, maybe some of you uh, are, are remember when um, uh, our, 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 our handsome, uh, progressive, and feminist uh, uh, prime minister uh, sent uh, this uh, tweet, uh, well, sent or wrote, I know which, which, which verb you have to use with a, do you tweet a tweet or? A, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so he tweeted, uh, as you may remember, to those fleeing pers persecution, terror, and war, Canadians will welcome you regardless of your faith. The diversity is our strength. That's our, our, a very strong, you know, uh, Canadian value, which is not always, you know, held to the, to the uh, you know, uh, to the, uh, the real ideal uh, that, 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 that we all think uh, we, we do in Canada. But, uh, and that was, of course, you know, uh, done, that, that was done, you know, the, I think the day following uh, the travel ban. Uh, well, so that's the context. So the question is, okay, this is the ideal Canada. This is the Canadian, what, what Blumenrad and others will call Canadian exceptionalism. Canadian exceptionalism. What does that mean? Canadian exceptionalism, well, you're, you're probably familiar with the term exceptionalism, but applied to the U.S., which is usually expected to be exceptional. But Canada is ex exceptional in terms of immigration. And that's actually proven once and again by all kinds of data. Uh, but one which is very uh, attractive when you look at Canada as a whole society is actually, you know, the one uh, uh, that we see uh, through, through, uh, through those tweets, the fact that public opinion is very strongly favorable to immigration. That, so that's something very important to keep in mind. But again, the question, you know, so while well, Canada is far more open uh, and optimistic, uh, uh, the policies of multiculturalism, so on and so forth, is Canada an outlier in immigration? So the question I, I would like to, uh, to, to dwell on, and we'll see that, yes, of course, Canada is very different, but why and in which ways when we go further than the myths of the, the very strong ideals, which are good. I mean, it's important for, for, I mean, I'd rather have a country where the ideal is that we are very open and very generous, even if the reality is not really, you know, that all the way, than having a country where, well, maybe your leader will say, you know, horrible things about uh, immigrants. I'm not talking about any country in particular. But, and, and, and again, is Quebec, is Quebec an exception within Canada? Because I would like also to see, well, you have Canada again, but then you have two different host societies which function very differently in terms of uh, immigration. So let's get very quickly, you know, that would be what you have on that slide would take me a whole term to develop. <laughs> so uh, just saying in which ways, uh, Quebec is different from Canada. But actually for you, uh, if you're not very familiar with, with, with Canada at all, or, you know, probably very little, uh, you need to know a couple of things about Canada as well. Uh, Canada is, a, is a federally bilingual, that, that probably you know English and French, uh, but uh, except for one bilingual province, a very small one, actually Canada's, uh, Canada's provinces are unilingual English. So actually, Canada is three quarters English, like the United States, and multicultural, of course, and multilingual in terms of, of languages from, from, uh, by, uh, brought by immigrants, uh, but, uh, and has a, uh, an official multicultural policy, which again, maybe you're familiar with. Huh? So the, the, at the state level, 
the government of Canada promotes multiculturalism. All policies uh, brought and developed by the federal government have to take into account the fact that Canada is a multicultural society. That's even in our constitution. So, so it's a very strong call to be, as a country, as a society, multicultural. Again, very symbolic, an ideal which is really very strong in terms of uh, support by, by the general public, not always, but generally that's the case, even in terms of all the, uh, poli the major political parties. And the other thing that you have to uh, point out, and now regarding uh, more specifically immigration, is that we have the very famous, in some circles, maybe you're not familiar with that, the, 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 the point system, the, 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 the system with which we select our immigrants. I don't know if you're familiar with that, is the fact that anyone can apply to become uh, 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 an immigrant to Canada, you have to fulfill, I mean, it's sort of it's like a, an exam or a, where you fill out, you know, form, you have to, uh, it's not only saying that you have uh, the abilities or the skills uh, to do this or that, you have to prove them, but once you get enough points, you get, for instance, uh, points for going to college, points for speaking English, points for speaking French, points for having professional experience. Uh, uh, if you're not too old, you get bonus points. So, you know, points for being young, so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, so that's been discussed as a merit-based immigration system. Uh, very liked by many people in the United States, uh, including uh, the, pres the current president uh, of your country. So uh, that means that, and again, I will try to discuss a little bit about that because th th this is seen, the merit-based, so the, the point system, immigration policy is very often uh, uh, described as the most efficient and rational approach to immigration. And that might be the case, but it has, I would say, hidden flaws. And uh, also I will mention that uh, in a moment. But uh, comparing with Quebec, Quebec, again, as a, I mean, it's there, has, it's not bilingual. I mean, many people arrive to Quebec saying, well, this is Canada, so English or French are on an equal footing. Well, that's wrong. Not only Quebec has one single for official language, which is French, but it's a protected language. That means that, for instance, English is banned in many aspects of uh, everyday life. Uh, you can't put a sign in English in front of your store. That's illegal. You can't answer the phone in English when some uh, customer calls. So there are many, many, many regulations that many people see as illiberal or very, uh, uh, you know, almost uh, anti-democratic, but they are explained by the fact, again, we could discuss this, uh, the, the, the merits of it, but also, you know, the reasons why. Uh, not only do, so French has this status, but it's a very, very uh, 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 strong status uh, that you wouldn't find any, any place. I mean, the same laws in the U.S. against Spanish would be uh, unacceptable. I think even in the current political context. So, again, you know, so we have very strong uh, immigrants are selected in terms of, uh, of their uh, uh, knowledge of French and so on and so forth. I'll get to that as well. So again, Quebec is not multicultural. So even if Canada is multicultural as a state, as a federation, Quebec rejects multiculturalism. Quebec is intercultural. That means a different thing that we might discuss as well uh, later. I will just say you, I say say to you. Uh, that uh, you can see interculturalism as something closer, sort of a mix between North American multiculturalism and uh, a European approach to integration, which some people would describe mostly as assimilation. That is, you need to become one of us, speak our language, for starters, but also very strong, for instance, on the notion that you have to keep uh, some of the, of your minority identity markers in the private uh, sphere of your life instead of uh, uh, you know uh, carrying them out in the open in 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 public life. Uh, 
so very strict in terms of uh, secularism and separation uh, between, well, what you call church and, uh, and the state, something that uh, is uh, very, very clearly said, for instance, in the context of France. So Quebec very often follows France's lead uh, in matters of uh, government policy. And again, Quebec is almost independent in terms of uh, the selection of immigrants. So immigrants that get to Quebec are not selected by Canada. They are only selected by Quebec. So that's very important as well. So it creates a very different sort of uh, immigration flats, but also that will have an impact on the uh, origins of the people that come to, to, uh, to uh, settle in, in, in Quebec. Just to give you uh, an idea of, of, of figures uh, before I get into that, uh, Canada uh, usually receives about a quarter of a million uh, authorized immigrants each year. And uh, last year it was uh, close to 300,000, and uh, it projects to go further than that. So it's, uh, it's getting closer to uh, one percent of the population each year uh, coming as uh, authorized immigrants. That's more than double what you have in the United States. We'll see the, 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 the figures now uh, in a moment, but Quebec uh, allows into the province about 50,000 immigrants per year. So one out of five or sometimes out of six immigrants to Canada come to Quebec through a very different stream selected by this very distinct society. So uh, let's get into some, just put everything here. Uh, this is quite uh, interesting to me and maybe surprising to you. Uh, I'm comparing uh, the three forms, three kinds or three status uh, uh, types uh, that are authorized as immigrants uh, in the three host societies I'm describing in the North American context. So the US, uh, English Canada, and Quebec. And what you see, uh, the blue part uh, describes the proportion of people who uh, enter the country as immigrants, legal authorized immigrants, uh, on the basis of family reunification, okay? So that means what you see there. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with, I mean, I, sometimes I, I, I take for granted that everybody in the US knows that, but you know, two, two thirds of authorized immigrants in the US come through uh, family ties, okay? The opposite trend you find in Canada. And that trend is further uh, 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 expressed in the context of Quebec. That is, more and more immigrants, and you can see the growth through the years, in, in, in Quebec come through the economic stream. That is, they have been selected in terms of their uh, skills as professionals, their education, their uh, ability to speak uh, French. That means that uh, what you have there is exactly what I was mentioning before, the fact that you have two different types of selection of immigrants, but we, you, you also have two kinds of, or even three kinds of, let's call it philosophies that underlie the approach to immigration. The interesting thing, and again, this is something that you might, you know, each one of you might have uh, an opinion about uh, which one is better and which, in, which one is better in terms of your of, of values or even the, the idea of justice? People who come through family ties, which is, I would say, in some regards, more humanitarian driven than a self-interest economically based approach to immigration, which is how Canada has been doing that for a while now and how Quebec is trying to do more and more. So reducing family ties immigration and uh, 
making more room to uh, what we call economic immigration. And actually, a new government in Quebec uh, 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 that came to power a, a month ago has actually said exactly that. We need more economic immigrants and less family immigrants. That's kind of the discourse that you're starting to hear uh, here in the United States. Uh, and again, I, I, I would just, you know, submit the idea that I, I'm not taking sides in terms of, of political, you know, figures or parties or, or propositions. The fact that one of the things that I want to stress out here is, 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 is that Canada, with the discourse of openness and generosity and multiculturalism, actually opens the door to something which in the end, at the end of the day, is very self-interested. The fact that they go for, they wanna get the elites from other countries. That is, people who are highly educated, who have the means, the mobility to come to uh, Canada. So that, that, that's an idea I, I wanna, uh, 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 you know, just uh, uh, put into the, in, into the, into the, the discussion. Now, let me, uh, well, this is, just very quickly, so Quebec has a very, some would argue that Quebec's approach to immigration is probably the most uh, rational, self-interested, uh, you know, uh, perspective that you can have on immigration. And what we're seeing in Quebec, and I will show you some information, some data about that, is that that doesn't even mean that immigrants selected that way will really integrate as well as you would expect. So again, you could make the argument that family tie immigration leads to better results in integration. And some research is showing that English Canada actually is getting away from a only economically based approach to immigration and putting more, more focus on family ties because the results might be even better because that creates diasporas that then will integrate uh, more quickly and efficiently to the, uh, to the whole society instead of just going after individuals who are supposed to be better fitted for the job market. So using only those kinds of indicators. So, of course, one of the, the ironies of, and again, I use that uh, to show that no uh, immigration system, even the, you know, the, the merit-based system uh, point approach, uh, uh, will lead to the results that you're expecting. One of them uh, that's been uh, very discussed in Quebec is that the focus on the use of French as a condition to be able to uh, come as a skilled worker, as an immigrant uh, to Quebec, uh, has led to uh, uh, to the growth of three, uh, quick and rather uh, significant growth of three diasporas, which are becoming uh, among the immigrant population dominant in the province. And th those are uh, immigrants from North Africa uh, who speak Arabic, but who are usually, because they come from the, the upper uh, classes, they also speak uh, very fluent French because they've studied in, in French language universities. But then Latin Americans, skilled workers from Latin America, and uh, people from, from Haiti, because again, their French uh, background, particularly when they are uh, highly skilled and highly uh, educated. But again, the, the, the fact that many of the immigrants come from, from uh, uh, North African countries and uh, 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 Arab countries, that means that many of them are Muslim, and they bring their religion and their way of practicing and showing their religion, religion in the public sphere that will go against uh, integrationist, assimilationist uh, notions in Quebec, and also, of course, this secularist and uh, uh, laïque, uh, that's uh, laïcité, that's, uh, that's a French word, for the notion that you can't uh, show religion uh, in the public sphere. Actually. Uh, a law a couple of years ago was passed in Quebec, in Quebec uh, by the Liberal government, which is supposed to be the most open to immigration, uh, banning uh, head covering uh, in, when dealing with government uh, agencies. So if you're a Muslim woman wearing a burqa, for instance, uh, you, you're not allowed 
uh, to uh, go to the unemployment office and uh, claim your, 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 what's due to you. You have to either uncover or forfeit your rights. And that's in progressive Canada, where these people, including Muslim immigrants, have been selected because of their professional skills. So you can see how it can backfire for the society and how that might create ethnic boundaries uh, that uh, will, uh, at the end uh, of the, uh, you know, uh, very, very quickly discriminate against uh, particular groups, in this case, uh, f from, uh, with a particular origin, and uh, among them, uh, women. Uh, this, well, there's a lot of information here, but just, just to give you the sense, I'm working on, you know, on, on socioeconomic uh, data, and that shows that, for instance, uh, just what we want to get from here, I mean, what I do, maybe, you know, the, the way I do it may, may, may interest you. I, I just, I mean, I, I use, I take the, the male non-immigrant, non-minority Canadian average or median income, and I say, okay, that's 100% or $1. And then I see what happens with the uh, men, women, uh, minority, non-minority, immigrant, non-immigrant, and Canada, Quebec. And what I see, for instance, is at the bottom of the pyramid, what you get is the worst of group in the country, which is immigrant, minority, women who work in Quebec. They make 40 cents for each dollar earned by the male, white, not native Canadian counterpart. So what you see there is that Quebec having the most economically oriented, uh, arguably the most efficient system of immigration in terms of merit base and selection, again, gives few, fewer opportunities to women, particularly to women, to men too, uh, when uh, they have to integrate into the job market. Again, the questions are why? Is it discrimination, outright discrimination, open uh, intolerance, or something systemic going on? But again, uh, what we have to see is that uh, you have to take into account the whole society's institutions, its structure, the policy that brings people over as immigrants, and then how the whole thing works out in terms of social relations. And again, uh, there's uh, an argument to be made here that that kind of approach is not giving uh, the best results. Actually, it's giving the worst results in the context of Canada. So now let me go, I, I don't wanna, yeah. I'll, I'll try to get uh, to the, I, I'll skip, you know, uh, I'll, I'll get to the, to the Latin American uh, context, uh, to the Latin American immigrant, uh, issue here. Uh, so in Canada, we have much smaller, recent, diverse, and fragmented Latino population than the, than the United States. That's that's obvious. Uh, in English language provinces, uh, there's Latin Americans are negligible in terms of numbers of size compared to other groups. We saw that. I, I, I didn't. Uh, uh, you know, you saw that uh, here uh, in, in, in the immigrant uh, languages uh, slide. Uh, most uh, immigrants in the rest of Canada speak uh, Cantonese, Mandarin, Punjabi, uh, or Tagalog. So that tells you about the importance uh, of those immigrant uh, groups uh, in the rest of Canada. While in Quebec, they uh, constitute a much salient group, and one which is growing uh, very fast. Uh, but also there's the fact, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, Jose, that uh, there's a perceived cultural affinity, given the fact that uh, Quebec, being uh, French, uh, might see itself as uh, connected to a larger Latin worldview, uh, the Catholic imprint uh, that's uh, in, in its culture, even if it's become quite secular. And again, Latin Americans represent a larger group in relative terms and salience. Something else which is very important to see in terms of uh, national origins, so the diversity of the Latin American or Latino population is that of course, as you also uh, may know uh, in the US, 
uh, you have a very significant part of what you would describe or uh, count as Latin Americans or Latinos or Hispanics in the US uh, explained through uh, actually three uh, origins and particularly uh, Mexican origin, okay? So you see the, the, the numbers here, three out of four people who will self-define as Latino or Hispanic in the US comes from either Mexico or, or will say that his origins or her origins are in Mexico, Puerto Rico, or Cuba. While in Canada, you have no predominant uh, origin uh, among the groups, and that's all the more so all, um, truer in Quebec, where you have a very fair distribution of national origins. That, so that makes up a mix which is extremely interesting. That is, Quebec has the most diverse Latin American population in North America, and maybe compared to other country, to other kind of host societies, maybe in the world. So that that's giving uh, room to a very interesting way of diaspora formation. So you have diversity of origins, selected immigrants that because of the process itself are highly skilled and they see themselves in Quebec, in French Quebec, as closer to the host culture, to the dominant society. And people in French Quebec see them as less threatening than the other large group of immigrants coming uh, f uh, since a few uh, years now, that is people from North Africa, uh, Arab countries, and Muslim countries. So th again, that should be a reason why Latin Americans should do very well in Quebec. Highly skilled, selected because of their language uh, uh, proximity, so on and so forth, and a very uh, good perception, very uh, favorable perception of them uh, by public opinion. And they don't do as well. So. What we're working on, I'm working on with, uh, with other people, is on issues of self-identification. I won't dwell into that. I mean, if you're interested, we can go back to, this is a very complex thing, how we count, how you define. You know, these are census questions that help me, for instance, in my research, try to understand who's Latin American or Latino and who's not. And as you can, I mean, you don't see it's very, uh, the, the, the type is very, uh, the, the, the font is very small here from, as, as you see it. But uh, uh, for instance, half of people who define themselves as Latinos in the US will also consider themselves racially white. And ironically, in Canada, among people who will describe themselves as having an origin in uh, Latin America, only one third will define themselves as white. Again, there are many uh, questions and hypotheses about that. And again, that, that might show us different sets of incentives in both Canada and the United States regarding how you will position yourself in terms of race. Either to go further into your own Latino self-identification or you will be maybe pulled towards or pushed towards uh, trying or willing to uh, define yourself as a non-minority. Uh, and that plays out different, uh, differently in uh, both uh, contexts. Uh, so I'll conclude with uh, these uh, issues uh, that I think we might further want to uh, explore. Uh, is there an existing or emerging or potential in, in terms of eventually one day North American or even global at some point as I mentioned before, diasporic Latino Hispanic identity or should we focus on diverging Latino Hispanic identities in terms of uh, ethnicities in terms of languages, in terms of national origins, and uh, of course, of course, in terms of social class. And again, that's something we're looking into in Canada, the fact that you will see differences in terms of uh, class that will have an impact or on self-identification as Latinos, something that you see also in the United States. Uh, there's increased mobility and transnational ties. Uh, families might have, as in my case, for instance, uh, you know, siblings uh, uh, on both sides of, of the border, uh, U.S., Canada, uh, but also maybe elsewhere. So again, should we talk about something emerging in terms of, a, of, of, of those transnational ties? We know that there's this uh, a growing phenomenon of return migration, Mexican people going, for, usually forcibly going back 
uh, second generation uh, Mexicans going, uh, being uh, returned to their, their country, but there's also uh, uh, other, uh, other uh, um, uh, phenomena uh, in terms of, uh, of the, the, the fact that we shouldn't look at diasporas only within a single country. And that's true for the United States uh, Latino population and other groups. Uh, the second set of questions, and I'll end with that, uh, again, going back to the, to the beginning, the fact that we have multiple settings and we need to look more into how different societal and institutional processes and different mixes of nation, national origins and socioeconomic backgrounds and different strategies of, of ethnic uh, boundary making uh, will uh, impact in the ways in which diaspora is formed. And we have to try to understand which, are, which of, of those differences are explained by structural factors. For instance, Canada, one of the reasons why we can have so such a, let's some say, we'll say generous or at least efficient and rational system of immigration, it's because of our geography, the fact that we don't have borders with other countries except the United States, which serves as a very high wall separating the country, our country, from the rest of the world. We have the oceans and the Arctic. So no one enters Canada if you're not invited. When you have that, you can get very selective. So that's one of the things, for instance, geography explaining why Canada does things differently. Uh, it's not only that, history, politics, economy, so on and so forth. Some things might be changed, others not, like, again, geography. Uh, but I'm also interested in the fact that immigrants themselves will develop through agency, through their own choices and actions, different strategies in their process of integrating into their host societies, and that might or not get to connect them to their Latino identity. Again, it might be interesting, useful, uh, relevant for some people, and for some people it will not. And uh, we're exploring that in Canada, we're exploring that through, through uh, surveys, and uh, again, that's something that we might, there's lots of data on that here in the United States, but we don't have uh, enough of that information in Canada, but once we have, we will be able to make, uh, to draw compare, to draw parallels and, and see what's different. And again, you know, the very last of them, it's uh, something I mentioned before, are there socially, politically, politically useful lessons to be learned by comparing the different contexts? Again, you know, this is a call for decentering our analysis of, of immigration in general, and particularly Latino, Hispanic, Latin American immigration in particular in, in, an, in a wider North American context, including Canada, and seeing that Canada has Quebec as a very different uh, settl uh, settling society, uh, settlement society, and what we can uh, take uh, from there. And again, not only as scholars, you know, and, uh, so, so we can develop, you know, a, a better knowledge and better theoretical tools, but also in develop eventually developing policy. So uh, can uh, the United States uh, find some inspiration in the Canadian approach? Can that be exported to the United States or other countries and vice versa as well? Uh, and again, that might lead us to understand that maybe, for instance, the US is not as much as a country of immigration as Canada, for instance, in terms of just raw numbers, or that Canada is not as good as dealing uh, with immigration or not as uh, idealistic in terms of how it approaches uh, the issue of immigration and multiculturalism. That's it, thank you. Questions, I'm sure that, Um, I actually had two questions. The first was a bit conceptual, and it was whether you viewed cultural assimilation or like national integration as necessarily discriminatory. 
Um, and the second was about your methods and whether you mainly relied on census data or whether you, you know, used more interviews to sort of understand more of like a lived experience of yeah. these immigrants. Well, actually, uh, very, two, two very good questions. The first one actually, I mean, you're right in, in, in bringing that up in terms of a, uh, if you're, I mean, you're saying uh, thinking about, you know, assimilation as a way of, of integrating immigrants to a society. Uh, yes, it can be. Some people will say that's uh, forcing them to abandon their own identities and uh, making them become something else. Uh, actually, the people who think that. Uh, or the people who think the opposite won't see that as something negative. Again, Quebec, actually, public opinion shows that, in general, uh, Quebecers think that immigrants should assimilate. And that would be good for them, and that would be good for society as a whole. Now, that explains why they will support the majority of, 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 of Quebecois, Francophone Quebecois, will support laws such as the one I, I described before. Uh, and not only that, for instance, as I said, you know, forcing people to speak French, forcing people to, uh, to uh, send their kids to French school. I don't have, my kids don't have the right to attend an English uh, language school, for instance. They are, I mean, some people w w would say banned from attending a school even if Canada is supposed to constitutionally guarantee that uh, every parent uh, can choose uh, English or French as the language of education. So again, Quebec has chosen a very strong assimilation, assimilationist approach, uh, but people who support that don't think that that's discriminatory or even bad for anyone. The thing is that, that most immigrants feel differently. They feel that forcing them to, uh, to adapt and uh, abandon their own heritage uh, is wrong. Uh, of course, that might boil down to, uh, to, uh, to opinions uh, or what you feel or your perspective either as an immigrant or as a member of the receiving society. Having said that, now we could go to evidence and try to understand, well, which one works better? So there's an argument to be made that data shows, evidence shows that uh, Canadian multiculturalism works just fine. And actually, my data, you know, from census, and I get to the second, you know, the data of, uh, of income uh, and other socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic indicators are used from the census and other sources, but from, from, the, from the Federal Agency of Statistics. And yeah, it seems that leaving just people alone, like multiculturalism in Canada, in English Canada tends to do, works better than forcing them to become uh, assimilated, which is how things are done in Quebec, and results show that does, that is not working as well. So, so yeah, a method, uh, in terms of methodology, census, but also I, I, I also do surveys and, uh, and some, some, some interviews to uh, qualitative uh, stuff uh, we do as well in our lab. This is extremely interesting, and I'm a sociologist, and I wanted to ask you as a sociologist, how about history? How about the irony of a country that has probably the only other country within it and manages rather well? To what extent yeah. can one learn anything from history, either looking at the US or looking at Canada in terms of this? I mean, well, the irony is, blows me away. <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, you know, uh, one, uh, th th this slide that I, I went over uh, without uh, stopping on it, uh, you know, Canada's exceptionalism, one of the ways that we could try to, uh, to explain that in terms of history is that uh, we don't have, I mean, not everybody agrees on, on that. I, I have the, 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 the I, I do think that Canada has what we can call a weaker national identity, a weaker core uh, of, uh, during its uh, own process of nation building, there never was really, uh, for instance, a narrative. I mean, let me remind you, because again, I mean, even Canadians, 
sometimes I need to tell them that Canada is the only large country in the Americas that never uh, fought a war of independence vis-a-vis -vis their colonial masters. It's the only country that never went through an independence revolution. You know, every single country in, in, in Latin America, and of course the United States, fought, you know, Spain or, 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 or the British, uh, Canada, uh, never did that. There's no, we don't have any heroes of independence. Uh, we don't commemorate any wars except uh, 1812 against the United States, which is our only pride. You know, <laughs> we, we won that war. <laughs> Even if you think that, <laughs> you know, you know manual, uh, history manuals, uh, textbooks in, 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 uh, in Canada say we won in the US, you say you won anyway. <laughs> But yeah, so, and then the fact that Canada actually was born as, as, a, as a marriage of convenience between two peoples, you know, the French and the English. And that means that uh, there's a very low level of pull towards a coherent national notion of belonging. That I think explains, once the British and French, you know, uh, uh, identities were, you know, uh, uh, dissolved during the, let's say, the 70s, you know, after the war and after, you know, uh, a couple of generations after that, and then, you know, uh, the, the, the new system of immigration, that will, that will make the population really diverse. At that point, there's no strong, I mean, the only strong, uh, uh, pulling factors towards something common is the idea of Canada, which is mostly an ideal, a promise, a notion that Canada is good and nice and, and open. That's, that's the kind of narrative. That leaves lots of room for diasporas to, uh, to, uh, to uh, emerge. And I would say that many people are, think that that's a danger to social cohesion and eventually, you know, people won't be loyal to the country. Let's say one day we need everybody to mobilize to go to war or defend our, our borders or whatever. And uh, maybe that might prove to be the case one day. But so far, having no defense uh, issues, uh, secu large security issues, so on. So the sense is that Canada works f just fine, leaving people alone. That's, uh, that, that's how, but, but then you add Quebec as a factor and that becomes more complex because of course Quebec brings the European approach to that. Nation building, you have to speak French. If you don't speak French, you're not a real Quebecois. That they will tell you in your face. And even today, after 30 years, I'm not a Quebecois, considered as such by the native French Quebecers. So it's, it's a very strong boundary. I mean, maybe because it's a, it's a minority, right? Yes. Uh, within the country, right? So exactly. there is a, a stronger ethnic component to their nationalism. Exactly. That's, that's how, how it is. Uh, I was going to ask you, uh, when they do these surveys on, of, on opinion, uh, public yeah. opinion about immigration, Canada usually shows a lot of tolerance, but it's yeah. very little, low levels of xenophobic or yeah proportion of people who think that immigration is bad uh, by much. Actually, it's interesting. The other countries that are like Canada tend to have something in common with Canada, which is strong welfare states. Yes. Scandinavian countries. So apparently where people feel secure, they're less likely to be anxious about difference and, and things like that. When there is more insecurity of all sorts, including, including economic, then people become less welcoming and less open and more anxious. and. I'm, I'm more vulnerable to demagogues exactly. too, I guess. But I was wondering if, if Quebec, in terms of opinion polls, it's like Canada or it's more like France and Italy? And yeah, well, that's, again, you know, I have some yeah, data on I, that. Because, uh, yeah, you have to, but yeah. uh, the thing is that uh, in general, for instance, you know, the first one, uh, there are too many immigrants that threatens the country's yeah, security. Yeah. And there you see that Quebec, and compared to the rest of Canada, there's not much difference. So in many respects, Quebecers at least 
when answering a, a, a polls, they, they will say uh, something like that. But on the other hand, very recent uh, surveys, uh, uh, and that's before the election, uh, the, to the question, uh, to, the, to the, the, the sentence, immigration presents a big or very big risk, uh, you had 53% among women and 43% among men wow. agreeing with that. So that describes an, a, a growing sense of, uh, of, uh, of uh, anxiety, as you were saying. So that, that's leading wow. Quebec towards something comparable to what's happening in, the, in, in, in Europe. Now, what you said before, that's, that's a very important uh, clue to understanding also what's happening in Canada. Canada, of course, is very strong in, in social policy compared to the US, you know, the, 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 the socialized, uh, you know, as you yeah. probably heard, uh, health and, and other, other uh, uh, aspects of, of everyday life where Canadians feel protected by their governments. Uh, again, you know, uh, social security, uh, education, access to uh, even college education, it's uh, much cheaper there than here. <laughs> uh, here. Um, so, uh, so what you said about Scandinavian countries, there's a paradox there because, as you said, if you're not worried because the, the government is taking care of you and you don't worry that immigrants will steal your jobs or something like that, and you have low levels of uh, crime and, uh, and so you feel that, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really uh, become an, uh, a problem to you. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, these very uh, strong social policy societies, and Quebec is one of them, Quebec is more socialist than Canada, than the rest of Canada. It's more like a Scandinavian country. Uh, you know, social policies uh, uh, managed by provinces, not by the federal government, part of it, but you know, uh, most of, a, of, of what will impact in your everyday life, like health, care, that's uh, the province that uh, uh, deals with that. And so everything goes well until your own, si that kind of system works well with a homogeneous society you know, like in Scandinavia or, or Quebec, where you feel that it is fair to share resources. When you get the feeling that people are coming from elsewhere and they would not deserve, you know, what you built and generations before you for your own country, your own society, then it becomes the argument to be anti-immigration. That is, we built this, and now they're ruining it. And so again, but, but you know, the, the argument is not that they don't deserve it. The argument is that they're abusing it. Uh, yeah, usually. yeah, yeah, yes, you're right. But but th something which is uh, quite uh, uh, interesting is that uh, they they w Quebec. Like, I, again, I, I was, I was going to tell Quebec you. Quebec is the most egalitarian society yeah. in North America, for instance, in terms of gender. Again, like Scandinavia. Uh, if you compare income uh, between uh, men yeah, and women, yeah, yeah. actually Quebec is the one that performs best within Canada and Canada compared to the United States. So you see, again, it's a very progressive, it's the most progressive province in terms of everything that you might think in terms of liberal values you know, same-sex marriage to uh, uh, abortion, everything, Quebec is in the lead. So very left-wing, socialistic, idealistic, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then you add the immigration issue and people will sometimes, like very surprisingly, become conservative. And th yeah. that's something that, and they elected a uh, right-wing government last week. And I say they because I didn't vote for <laughs> this particular government. And, uh, but the majority of Quebecois voted uh, very eagerly, yes. uh, enthusiastically even, uh, for this uh, new uh, first mi uh, prime minister. So that's something that we need to better understand. Yeah. Those are the current trends that we, that we need to uh, first understand sociologically and then, you know, maybe make sense of what can be done to, uh, to counteract the, 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 the nasty, uh, you know, consequences of that. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a question or something? Uh, yeah, uh, somebody told me that there's a very large Cuban community in Edmonton. Do you know anything about it? Cuban community? Cuban, yeah. In Edmonton? 
Uh, I don't know that particularly. I don't, I mean, very big. I mean, maybe uh, or significant, yes. Nothing in Edmonton is very big. <laughs> no, uh, no. Uh, that's uh, okay. That, no, that sounds interesting. They're, they're, they're interesting uh, uh, phenomena that uh, in, in Canada, when you get out of the big centers, you know, Toronto, Montreal, or Vancouver, where you see uh, particular communities, of course, you know, because of uh, maybe there's uh, a, a first diaspora that was formed there and then that will uh, attract other, other groups. So they're, they're interesting things uh, in terms of uh, uh, common backgrounds in, in Winnipeg, for instance, uh, in the province of Manitoba, right by uh, Alberta, so on and so forth. But uh, I, I never heard about that, that particular group. Yeah. Mm. You know, I was going to say that uh, something similar I have noticed in Wallonia, that is the French-speaking part of Belgium, right? Yeah. That there, the, uh, the um, attitudes toward Latino immigrants is that, that they're more like them, they're less problematic, they assimilate better uh, because they're Latin, vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Africans and Muslims and, and other immigrants whose alterity is more pronounced. Yes. Uh, so that sounds... <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, regardless of the fact that many, many of these Latino immigrants are not of European origin, so it's not a, ra a racial thing, it's, it's a cultural... Yeah. Uh, cultural trumps race. Yeah, because you, you have to, uh, it's interesting, for instance, again, you could compare also with, uh, with uh, what's happening with immigrants uh, in, in Catalonia, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. That is, it depends on how it will play. The, there's already, when you go there, there's already uh, a power, you know, relation between that particular society, Catalonia, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the rest of Spain or the, or the national government, Quebec, uh, mm. versus the rest of Canada, so on and so forth. So what, what you'll get is how immigration plays in that potential tension or conflict. So, for instance, Latin Americans, the Chileans that arrived in the 70s, they were op welcomed with open arms in Quebec because they were very politicized, of course. They were, you know, mm. getting out of, of Pinochet's Chile. They were left-wing, and Quebec was that... And in the, the independence movie, movement in uh, that period of time in Quebec was growing, and it was, you know, uh, very, uh, they were very like-minded in terms of, you know, anti-imperialistic, uh, uh, you know, uh, stances, so on and so forth. So uh, Chilean intellectuals and, 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 and militants coming to Quebec were seen as allies in their struggle against colonial Canada, mm -hmm. the, as such it was framed mm -hmm. the, at that time. So when you have... Latin Americans coming uh, to, to Quebec and they are seen as culturally close, uh, they are usually considered as allies in terms, because they will assimilate quickly because of the common Latin background, and, uh, and they will see the, uh, the Northern African uh, people, uh, Arab and, and Muslim people, actually, yeah, they will put them as, they, they, they will construct this, 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 uh, this, uh, this boundary. But again, the, one of the, the question mark, uh, and I'm working with, with, with communities, with uh, Latino communities in, in Montreal, because we're trying to make sense of the fact that Latinos in Quebec earn less than other groups, including uh, people, uh, members of the Arab uh, diaspora. So we're trying to understand why Quebecers like Latin Americans feel comfortable with them, uh, feel that they're close in terms of culture and language, and, and Latin Americans feel usually close to uh, French uh, Quebecers, even uh, uh, with their progressive stances and so on and so forth, and then uh, they will not be considered, you know, Latin Americans, uh, that's what we're getting, and, and then that's a different uh, a mythology because we, we didn't... Uh, uh, witness reports uh, during, uh, we did a sort of a public consultation on, on this on systemic discrimination with other, with groups of the Latin American civil uh, community, and we found out that uh, Latin American workers are very often seen by employers as low-skilled, uh, low-value uh, uh, employment uh, candidates. So even if they come with a, with a degree from a, a university, their 
you will find the stereotype about the Latino, you know, uh, cheap labor uh, probably, you know, coming from the United States towards the north. And that, that has, uh, for instance, we found out that uh, accents, speaking French with a Spanish accent, is very bad for you when you're going to, uh, trying to get a job or a promotion because it sounds as if you're not educated. That's, we're puzzled by that because that's not, I mean, there's no history of that in, in Canada, in Quebec. That's through, you know, I would say even uh, mass culture, uh, you know, uh, that comes to Canada as this, this notion that uh, the caricature of the, of the Spanish speaking person trying to, uh, to speak French with, a, with, and the accent triggers a response that we found out that is consistent with the, the idea that, well, yeah, you're, you're a hard, you know, Work working hard. person, so you can clean the room. But I won't give you the job for the uh, managing job. That goes to, actually, ironically, that goes to the very well, uh, very skilled speaking French, sp to the Arab person yeah. who speaks very well yeah. French yeah. with a perfect accent. Yeah. I mean, but that's, all of these people coming from the Maghreb, from Morocco, from Algeria, uh, they speak French as a uh, uh, na native, native level because exactly. these are the most educated people. Exactly. There must be also a, a, a stronger element of, of selection uh, in the case of you know people from North Africa or, or other places, right? And for Latinos, like it is the case here. I always give the example of uh, Mexicans and Indians from India, right? That Mexicans in Mexico are twice as likely to have a college degree as Indians from India. But the number of Mexicans in the United States that have a college degree is 9%. For the Indians, it's 77%. Not because Indians are more educated than Mexicans, but because of the level of selectivity. Exactly. Well, again, you know uh, this, yeah. So that, I mean, obviously Morocco and Algeria are much poorer countries than Mexico, less educated countries than Mexico, but the level of selectivity is much higher. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, for instance, uh, yeah, uh, the high school uh, diploma less, and you see the, the big difference again, uh, it's because the selection process in Canada brings people with degrees. Uh, yeah, but this seems that it's not the official selection process, yeah. but another selection process that is not official. Well, that is yeah, you. and uh, let, let me get to something, yeah. you know, uh, which is, you know, maybe the darker side of, of, uh, of the Canadian merit-based approach. Again, people will defend that as saying, well, it's a win-win thing. People will arrive here to Canada with already all the skills and background necessary to get very quickly a job. If you bring people who are not prepared, don't speak the language, don't have the degrees, the experience, they will struggle. So they will become disenchanted and maybe radicalized or or get to uh, you know, crime or so. So every, it's a win-win. That would be the selling argument of a merit-based system, point system uh, uh, approach. Yeah, there's some, there's some truth to that. But on the, on the other hand, what you're doing is that you're saying, okay, your selection process will get people who are defined by certain socioeconomic um, uh, features. Let's say Latin America. You say, okay, give me Latin America, give me your, instead of saying what the, the Statue of Liberty says, <laughs> give me your educated, highly skilled, mobile, very motivated, young people. They will, and, and I'm saying, and I'm, I'm, you know, the one addressing Latin America, it's Canada, and I'm saying Guatemala, Honduras, Brazil, give me those. That selection process will give me white people rather than black, if you're talking about Brazil, that will give me, that will give me higher cl social class instead of lower social class, that will give me urban people instead of rural people, that will be, so on and so forth, understand? So what we're saying is we're selecting through a, a, an apparently very objective color blind, color and, you know, blind about anything else, just your 
just give me what you have as a, as a professional, as a skilled worker, but then the effect, the consequence of that is that you're selected, selected ethnically and through social class. And uh, that creates, again, very different diasporas. And you can question the fairness or the, you know, the, the justice value of that kind of approach. Th that's where I'm getting more critical of what Canada does. Yeah. Yes, hi. Um, two questions. Um, one of them is an observation. Uh, as I understand, Canada has a lot of land that is not livable, right? Uh, except uh, Quebec, Ontario, uh, the West. Because I see on the map, you know, there's so much, uh, it looks unlivable. Is that right? Is that, is that right? Uh, you mean that it's... Uh... That is uh, unde uh, undeveloped. Uh, it's, uh, it looks to me like mountains and... Well, I, I, one, one thing that you have to know about Canada is that the vast majority of Canadians actually live on a very uh, narrow strip along the U.S. border. It's like that's, that's what everybody I was talking lives, about. Uh, at, I mean, I think 80% of Canadians live within 100 miles from, from the U.S. There's, <laughs> you could argue that there's nothing or no one, of course, the indigenous peoples and, uh, and, and other communities, I'm not saying. But, you know, the vast majority lives very concentrated, yes. Okay, so when the Canadian government says, oh, we, we will take people, uh, will they send people to these areas that are of that border area, no. or they will uh, place them in the uh, uh, cities, uh, along the main cities? Actually, the vast majority of immigrants settle in, in the main uh, cities, uh, Toronto, Montreal. Actually, there, that's a political topic uh, in, in Quebec, the fact that, you know, Many people among, you know, native uh, French Quebecers think that the immigration system is failing because of the fact that 80% of immigrants to Quebec settle in the city of Montreal. And they feel that actually those immigrants should go to what it's called the, the, the regions, so out, outside, outside the, 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 the city of Montreal. And, uh, but, but Canada can't send people anywhere. I mean, yeah. uh, the moment you're, um, you get into the, the country, uh, you, so Canada has very densely concentrated populations in general. Immigra immigrants are very concentrated as well. But on the other hand, something which is worth noting, compared maybe to s some of uh, the, the things that you see in the United States or in Europe, there's very little segregation in terms of where uh, immigrants and minorities live within the cities. There's, uh, there's a mix of, of, of population in almost every part of uh, Montreal or of Toronto. That's, that's worth noting. Uh, my second question is on the language, on uh, French in Quebec. Yeah. Uh, I understand that if you speak French from France, they, uh, it's dif different than Quebecois. So a person that got a good education uh, from the Caribbean in French yeah. will uh, struggle in uh, Quebec because they, they, they speak French, but it's not their uh, dialect. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, um, uh, yeah, the Quebecois speak a, a different kind of French, which is French, but uh, with an accent, a strong accent as seen by other French-speaking people uh, in other countries, and particularly in France, uh, they will, yeah, I mean, the Quebecois will sometimes resent someone speaking with a, with a, with a French from France accent. And that might be seen also as a sign that you're not really assimilated. They like it when you speak. I mean, language is the main marker of difference in the province of Quebec. What you speak and how you speak it. That's why also the, the, the accent I was mentioning about, you know, the, 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 the Hispanic immigrants, the moment you speak French as a Quebecois, that might be the moment where you're, you're accepted as one of them. Uh, so 
I will never be one, really. My children, probably, if they want, because they, they speak French with a Quebecois uh, accent. No, no, no. Actually, uh, you know, French. Uh, that regards also, you know, the, the status of, uh, of uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, how lang global languages work in terms of the what uh, in French it's called the norm, the linguistic uh, norm, which is considered to be the the right way of speaking a language. So French is the most. Uh, I know how to put it, you know, where the norm is the strongest. Everything that derives, that, that, that distinguishes the way you speak from the Paris-based French is considered having an accent and less good. If you're from Marseille, your accent is not good enough. And if you're from uh, Martinique, worse. And if you're from Quebec, they will mock you the moment you land in France. That's how it works. And that's very strongly felt. So that's, you know, resentment and everything. Uh, I would say the opposite would be Spanish, where, you know, speaking with an Argentinian accent or a Mexican accent or a, Span Sp a Spanish from Spain accent doesn't really bring the notion that one is better than the other. I, I, I would, you know, it's like more, you know, democratic in that regard. And I would say English is more... Like you have to, uh, more than that, but I mean, I, I have the feeling that British accent feels like higher, more something, no? higher, yeah, posh, yes. But you won't sense that someone speaking with a different accent is less worthy of attention. Uh, in French, your accent distracts from the content of your message. If I go to, I mean, I, I lecture in France, and my accent is between French from France and French from Quebec, and they will, they might get distracted by the fact that I speak funny, even if I speak correct French. The, I don't think that would happen if a Salvadorian speaks in Spanish uh, in front of a Mexican crowd or, or whatever. And I don't think in English you have that problem. Well, I, in English there was, uh, a totem pole, so to speak, Oxford English or Queen's English, BBC English and things like that. Yeah. But, but it has become irrelevant. Uh, there is a, a great anecdote of a, uh, a colleague of mine who, they, he was amazed, he's from e England, but he's from Northern England. And in, in, in England, Northern English is seen as working class and yeah. low class and things like that. And he said that he was amazed that in the United States, people will think it's so posh. <laughs> But he was speaking when he was actually a working class dialect from Leeds or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm from the UK and that's definitely true. <laughs> okay. um, people can like tell where you're from in the UK based on your accent. Like when I was in the US, um, I met a group of girls and one of them was from a place in Newcastle, which is near where I live, uh, well, which is where I live. Um, and her accent was like somewhere that's 30 minutes drive from my house and I could tell where she was from compared to me. Um, but I would definitely say like there's a, there's a north-south divide in terms of accent. So if you have a very neutral accent, it's like considered posh, you're considered of a higher class. So there's definitely like a class distinction and often an education distinction. So if you have a more neutral accent, then you're considered more well-educated. Mm. Yeah. I think in regards to accent, a distinction might be, I think English, you can tell class distinction from your accent, but having an accent wouldn't, like one accent wouldn't be considered more correct over another. Like an American accent wouldn't be considered less correct than a British accent. But there's like a class this, like association with each accent. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I was going to say that, for example, Southern English has a low reputation in the United States, but upper class people from the South speak with a Southern uh, drawl, right? So for them, maybe their class, I mean, maybe also there, there is 
different ways of signaling class membership other than accents, the, the, your vocabulary, you, you know, things like that. Yeah. Well, that's a fascinating. Uh, oh, what, 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 that's the last question. Uh, when they said that, uh, you were saying that uh, the French cannot understand the Quebecois and things like that, vice versa. I mean, sometimes in, in, in about Spanish speakers, they say the same thing, but it's nonsense. I mean, I, you can understand me, uh, perfectly, 100%. Uh, Chilean, Spanish, right? So it's, it's a lot of homogeneity in terms of understanding. Yes. Uh, I mean, there are dialects, not dialects, as accents, sounds, but not. Yeah. So in the Quebecois French, is that distinct from peninsular, from uh, a European French? No, but it has an well, a strong accent, so a strong, but maybe, you know, southern in U.S. English, maybe to uh, someone from the Midwest, maybe. There's, you don't get when there's, you know, speaking very, very, very quick, uh. fast, maybe that. And then there are some vocabulary differences, but that would be, you know, what you find among yeah, uh, different Spanish, Spanish uh, yeah. speakers in, 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 across uh, the Americas. And uh, the, th the third component would be that uh, French... Uh, Quebecois French actually is a form, uh, it comes from an um, uh, uh, archaic Gas uh, yeah. 17th century uh -huh. French. So it has some quirks that you need to know beforehand because some of the ways you will use, and then it gets into the grammar, and that might prove more difficult uh -huh. to understand because you will use some, once you, you know the list of you know things that you have to pay attention to, then it becomes very 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 understandable. But but there are some things that you know when I first arrived, I, I learned French at the Alliance Française, so it was really normed uh, you know Parisian French, and I actually couldn't understand uh, much of the things that they were that people were saying to me until, and that was before the internet, so I couldn't check you know to see a. Uh, ways in, you know, a, a YouTube video where, where how the Quebecois speak. Now, now you have them and they explain to you and you see, okay, now I get it because they will change the order of the, the or, or the gender of a word or the, or uh -huh. the, the sense or the, 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 the way they use a, a, a verb and it throws you off. Uh, uh -huh. you, you don't, you say, they, they're saying, they're talking, what, what are they talking about? Uh -huh. I mean, I, 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 you know, I remember, you know, there's a way when they will ask you, uh, uh, is, is, is Tom gone, you know? Uh, they, I, I was uh, uh, an international student at that point, and uh, someone asked me in French that kind of question. But to a French ear, if you don't understand, the way they were using the verb, it sounded as, Tom, are you gone? <laughs> and I was... And I was like, I'm not Tom. <laughs> he knows that I'm not Tom. And I'm not gone because he's seeing me here. So, and I say, I, I, did, I mean, you imagine my face. And then he insists slowly, <laughs> like, you know, again, you know how you treat you when you don't, you know. And I, and I hear, Tom, are you gone? And he was asking, is Tom gone? So again, it's just one thing that you change in the, uh, uh, in a, uh, instead of using uh, il, which is third person, uh, they will use sometimes uh, tu, uh, second person. So it's like changing uh, he or she, uh, exchanging with uh, you. It doesn't make sense until you understand how it, it plays in, in their grammar. Again, once you know that, you're good for uh, you know for the rest of you. So now you're, they're going to give you citizenship, Quebecois citizenship, yes. the first citizen of Quebec. Quebec. Thanks a lot. Thank you.